and welcome to Kent Tonight live on KMTV. I'm Louisa Britton, your top stories on Tuesday the 5th of December. Green energy, but at what cost caused to shut down plans for Britain's biggest solar park? With a huge solar farm in, on the marsh, it will impact people's um, desire to come and walk here and enjoy the, 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 the countryside. Kent's roads claim another life. Man in his 20s dies near Maidstone. It was along this road, Linton Hill in Staplehurst near Maidstone, where a 22-year-old man died in a crash. Made in Kent, we check out one of the county's only grass-fed farms in Seven Oaks. What's so unique about 100% grass-fed is that every piece of land is slightly different. And in sport, I'll fight for free. Kent boxer Grant Dennis demands English middleweight title rematch. But first this evening, a village in East Kent says its future could be in doubt if plans for Britain's biggest solar farm goes ahead. Residents in Graveney say they don't know what their lives will look like if the £400 million development happens on their doorstep. The public consultation on the project began today and Harry Pete has more. Today marks the first day that you can have your say on a proposed plan to build a huge solar panel park between Whitstable and Faversham. The £400 million project will be the biggest of its kind in the UK and could help to ease some of the demands on the national grid in the county and also reduce our carbon footprint. But not everyone is pleased with the plans. Now, it may not look like much at the moment, but the site to the right of me here in Graveney could, if plans go ahead, be the site of a solar panel farm that could provide power to more than 100,000 homes here in Kent. Now, whilst most people are in agreement that green energy is a good thing, those who live in the village and surrounding towns say that the sheer size of the site, which is around 890 acres, which to put in comparison for you is around 400 football pitches, it's just way too big and it's gonna have a massive impact on traffic, the wildlife, and even business. The, the response by some of the residents here is, is very, you know, they're very worried. They're very worried what, what's gonna have the impact it's going to have on their lives but as I say initially the, the response was great you know renewable energy we need it um, and we're not saying not in our backyard but you know we've got to make sure it doesn't really hurt either the community or or the the wildlife that's in our area. Adrian Oliver owns the Free Wheel Cycle Cafe in Graveney and sees construction traffic as another short-term issue especially for his customers. When we realised the size of it, I think everybody was a bit shocked, actually, that it was going to be so big. And, uh, you know, the, obviously the concerns of the village are, you know, the, the, the construction traffic, that w which we've just recovered from having the substation in, uh, constructed in, in Graveney. Now we're having the solar park, and again, it's so big, we're worried about the construction traffic. Hive, the energy company behind the plans, said that they'll be looking into the environmental concerns during the public consultations and say that it's a pioneering project. One supporter when the plans were first unveiled was Canterbury MP Rosie Duffield, who said that she was excited by the idea of the solar park. Renewable energy is fantastic and exciting. We don't want to use fossil fuels, if at all possible, in the future. Um, I know there are lots of concerns about that particular site in terms of being a great place for wildlife, but obviously in theory that's a fantastic idea and it would benefit us greatly in this part of uh, Kent. The next public consultation is in Faversham tomorrow morning at the Assembly Rooms on Preston Street between half 11 and 7.30 in the evening. Harry Pete for KMTV in Graveney. Now, a man in his 20s has died in a head-on crash in Staplehurst. Another man's been injured in the collision, which involved two cars. The road was closed for some time last night as emergency services dealt with the incident. Josie Hannett's been to the scene. It was along this road, Linton Hill in Staplehurst near Maidstone, where a 22-year-old man died in a crash. It happened just before half past nine last night. Now, as you can see and probably hear, this is a fairly busy road and cars can go up to the national speed limit. Um, 
ambulance, police, fire crews and the air ambulance were called to the scene, but unfortunately nothing more could be done to save the man. Now we don't know much about him at this stage. All that's been revealed is that he was 22 years old and his next of kin have been informed, but no doubt we'll find out more in the next few days. The crash involved a red Citroen C4 and a silver Ford Fiesta and officers closed the stretch between Rebel Lane and Starbridge Lane whilst they dealt with the incident last night. The cars were travelling in opposite directions and we've been told that the driver of the Citroen has been taken to hospital with minor injuries. Now police are appealing for any witnesses to come forward and anyone with dash cam footage which should help in their investigations. This is Josie Hannett in Staplehurst for KMTV. A former Metropolitan Police Assistant Commissioner said he may consider legal action against First Secretary of State and Ashford MP Damien Green. Bob Quick has called on Mr Green to retract allegations that he lied about discovering pornography on the MP's personal computer. It comes after allegations concerning Mr Green's conduct emerged last month, including claims his internet history logs indicated pornographic material had been viewed. The Ashford MP denies any wrongdoing. Now, a man's been charged with child abduction after he allegedly tried to leave the country via Dover with a 15-year-old. Gabriel Alexandru was arrested by police after a routine vehicle check at the port on Sunday night. A 20-year-old from Birmingham has also been charged with sexual activity with a child. He's due to appear at Medway Magistrates Court. A drug dealer from Gravesend who was found with cocaine, cannabis and more than £6,000 in cash has been sent to prison for two years. 21-year-old Jordan Martin was arrested after officers searched his parents' home in June last year and found the drugs. The court heard how Martin appeared to be selling the substances on behalf of his uncle whose mobile phone contained messages and tick lists associated with the supply of the drugs. Martin pleaded guilty to possession of cocaine and cannabis with intent to supply and possession of criminal property. Our police are appealing for a driver of a white transit van to come forward in connection with the murder of a pub landlord in Folkestone. The vehicle was spotted outside the Red Cow pub in Ford Road where 58-year-old Joe Daniels was shot dead in the morning of the 22nd of November. Our reporter Cameron Tucker has been following the story and joins me now. What more do we know about the police investigation? Well, as you said, Louisa, the police described the vehicle that they're looking for in connection with the case. We also know a little bit more about the individual uh, or an individual that the police are wanting to talk to. Um, they've described the driver of that vehicle as white, heavily built and with short dark uh, brown hair. They've also said the driver is between 30 to 50 years of age uh, and is also uh, of 5 foot 10 in height. So does this mean the police have a suspect in mind? Uh, well, no, not necessarily. The police are only wanting to speak with the driver in connection with the shooting of Joe Daniels. Um, the, they've said, and I'm quoting Detective Chief Inspector Richard Vickery here, there's no suggestion the driver has done anything wrong, but the van was parked there just before the incident happened, and we're hopeful uh, they may have seen or heard something that could aid our investigation. Um, the, the police have also stressed that their inquiries are still ongoing and they've appealed to anyone who uh, might have any information that could come forward, uh, including with possible dash cam footage as well from the scene. And the community in Folkestone has been quite affected by this incident, haven't they? Oh, very much so. It's been uh, around about a fortnight since um, since the incident happened. There's still a police cordon outside of uh, the pub at the, uh, uh, currently. Um, bouquets of flowers line uh, the, the walls of the pub uh, in commemoration to him of, of evidently someone who was a very popular um, landlord. Uh, a few of the tributes that have come forward, there's a darts player uh, from the pub uh, who called him amazing. Seriously, the, the nicest man who always greeted her with a big hug, um, adding it was sad that and, you know, he was going to be missed by so many people. Local cricket players come forward and said he was always smiling, nice and generous, um, with a great sense of humour. Uh, and, and finally, as well, there's one individual who we uh, believe to be a family member uh, who wrote their heartbroken, to say the least. He was a typical Mr Nice Guy uh, and will, of course, for all the family, be sorely missed. Thanks for that, Cameron. 
our commuters in Kent have been hit with the highest rail fare rise in five years. UK rail prices will increase by 3.4% on January the 2nd. This means a season ticket from Rochester to London on high speed rail will now cost an extra £200. We spoke to people at Rochester train station about the spike in prices. It's just very, very expensive. So for that reason, it's it's a bit of a shock, you know, especially for the system and people's affordability. So yeah, for that reason, I've got a bit of a problem with it. Well, I have to say, I think they've risen a lot. Uh, certainly over the last four or five years, they've gone up every year. I don't see an improvement in the service that we're getting. Trains seem more crowded, less efficient. There's more engineering work. I'd like to see where the money's going. I don't really like that the train fares are rising because I go there at least once a week, and like as a young adult um, it's just not a great affordable price for it to be going up for someone my age. Terrible quite honestly yeah because all this uh, with all the railways being run by private enterprise uh, the, the money is just going to shareholders and it's not going to help uh, anything on the on the railways themselves. It's ridiculous to be honest. <laughs> I don't think it's fair on people who commute long distances or young people yeah. for myself I'm not bothered because I don't often catch the train but I've got a lot of the family that commute to London and they feel pretty cheesed off about it because the train service is getting worse and worse and the fares are going up and up commuters in Rochester there but what do you think about rail fares do you think the increase is just too much join the conversation by using the ha hashtag Kent says on Twitter and coming up after the break, a sailing club's appealing for information after a defibrillator was stolen from their clubhouse. Don't go away. There was the possibility of keeping it within the club, but that wouldn't make it available 24-7. So we wanted to make it available out here, but it's just absolutely sickening and mindless that someone take a piece of equipment that can only be used to save lives. Charity in Rochester's banned homeless people from sleeping in the porch of their high street shop. A sign outside says police will be called if anyone sleeps in the area, but residents say they're outraged at the move. Here's Rachel Dixon. The Rochester branch of Hospice of Hope has come under fire for banning homeless people from sleeping under their porch. The charity shop posted a sign in their window that says, Sleeping in this area is not permitted. Police action will be taken against anyone for using the area for sleeping, leaving rubbish or any other waste. Strood resident Steve Povey felt moved enough to post on Twitter, saying, Charity shop, but no charity for the homeless. A representative from Hospice of Hope said, It might seem harsh, but having to clean human faeces on a daily basis is also harsh on our staff. We're very supportive of the plight of homeless people, but it's not fair on our staff to have to clean up that type of thing every day. No, I think it's not fair because um, they never create any sort of problem to the community and they're very, very quiet and um, homeless and homelessness is a very, very big issue. It's, it's uh, sad that homeless people have to sleep um, in the porch, but if it were my choice, provided they didn't leave a mess and they were not causing uh, an obstruction or being a nuisance, if it were my shop, I would let them sleep there. This is a charity shop that it's in. I think um, maybe they should be looking at what they can do to help if people in that situation are so desperate they've got to sleep in a doorstep. Well, then maybe they should be looking to see how they can do to help those people rather than just pushing them away. Well, it's a bit ironic, really, because it's a charity shop and any effort to make people have a decent night's sleep shouldn't be discriminated against. The signs should be um, put down and, uh, you know, unless they're going to do something for them. You know, at the end of the day, they, they have to get, they have to have somewhere to sleep where it, they're not in a wolf, they're not in nobody's way, they just want to get, get um, a little shelter for the night. Rachel Dixon at KMTV in Rochester. A life-saving device installed after the death of a sailing club member in Seasalt has been stolen. The defibrillator at the sailing clubhouse was taken at the end of last week and club bosses are now appealing for information. Our reporter Poppy Jeffrey went to find out more. 
it's just absolutely sickening and mindless that someone take a piece of equipment that can only be used to save lives. After Sea Salter Sailing Club member Tim Seymour died of a heart attack at sea at the age of 47, the club decided to install a defibrillator to hopefully prevent any more tragedies. But at the end of last month, thieves broke open the box and stole the device from inside. It had been funded by the club Whitstable and Herm Bay Lions and the British Heart Foundation. And now the £1,400 equipment needs to be replaced. About nine, ten years ago, one of our members was out sailing and disappeared overboard from his catamaran and was recovered by the patrol boat. Um, subsequently, we found out that... Well, Members and the emergency services tried for over an hour with CPR to resuscitate him. Subsequently, we'd, it was identified that he had a heart defect, which meant he was probably dead before he hit the water. What that led to is 30 of our members doing emergency first aid courses and for us to actively get a defibrillator on site. It's a very popular beach here with lots of holiday homes and camping sites and the beach is very popular in the summer and to have something like this available, there, there isn't another one available except in Whitstable. So we wanted to make it available out here. He now hopes someone might see the appeal and return the device to the club or hand it to a police station. Defibrillators work by administering a shock to a person whose heart is not beating as it should and they can really improve a person's chances too. When used alongside CPR within three minutes of cardiac arrest, a defibrillator can improve a person's chance of survival from 5% to 75%. A South East Coast Ambulance Service spokesperson said, this was a thoughtless act which puts lives at risk. The person or persons responsible should think about the seriousness of their actions and the impact they could have if such a valuable piece of life-saving equipment was needed. We would urge anyone with information to come forward and speak to police. The defibrillator is a white unit around 30 centimetres square and was taken in its orange carry case along with the leads and chest pads. This is Poppy Jeffrey for KMTV in Sea Salter. Brilliant. With a look ahead to the Jill's Checker Trade match this evening, here's Andy with the sport. Gilliam could host championship side Sheffield Wednesday should they progress into the third round of the FA Cup. The Jills have a replay at League Two Carlisle following a 1-1 draw at Priestfield on Saturday to negotiate first, though. The Owls currently sit 12th in the championship table and will travel to Kent provided Jills can see off Carlisle. Wednesday have reached the playoffs in each of the last two seasons, but a sluggish start to this campaign has seen manager Carlos Carvajal under pressure. Meanwhile, the Jills will be in action tonight at Priestfield as they take on Oxford United in the second round of the Checker Trade Trophy. Manager Steve Lovell says he'll be treating the game properly and will expect a strong performance from his side. With the busy Christmas period ahead for the Jills, the likes of Ben Nugent and Alex Lacey have been tipped for more game time. Forward Elliot List is also expected to be back involved after being left out of Saturday's squad. In boxing, Medway's Grant Dennis was beaten in an English middleweight championship fight on Friday and says he'll fight in a rematch for free. Elliot Matthews claimed victory over Dennis with all three judges scoring the fight in favour of the home fighter at York Hall. Despite the defeat, his team say that Dennis had done enough to win the bout and claim the belt. Speaking on Team Talk, the boxer also felt convinced he'd won. Like I say, at the time we're both combatants and we're, we're, we're fighting for a prize and um, I'm glad his health was cool and I walked away cool. But um, looking back at the fight, I, I definitely thought that I, um, I nicked it by about three rounds and I was, uh, yeah, bitterly disappointed. But um, I'll be back better and stronger and hopefully uh, a rematch is definitely on the cards with Elliot. To snooker and Ditton's Barry Hawkins reeled off six frames in a row to reach the second round of the Betway UK Championship. The number 10 seed was too good for Hammermeyer making breaks of 96 and 90 on his way to victory at the Barbican in York. Hawkins was two frames down before making his comeback, but admitted he'll need to be more clinical if he's to challenge for this year's title. He'll face world number 84 Sonny Akani in the last 32 tonight. 
In cricket, Kent will host a tour match against Pakistan in Canterbury next season. The game against the 2017 Champions Trophy winners will take place in April and could see the return of the world's leading leg spinner Yasser Sarr, who played three championship games on loan with Kent this summer. It will be the 11th time Kent have faced Pakistan in a first-class fixture at Canterbury, with the Taurus winners in three of their previous visits. That's it from me for now. I'll be back later. Next tonight, house prices have gone up in Kent by thousands of pounds. That's according to new figures which show that the average property price in Kent has risen by more than £10,000 in the last year. Well, joining me now on the sofa is the Managing Director of Dockside Property Services, Spencer Fortnite, to talk a little bit more about this. So, thanks for coming in. Uh, why do you think properties are becoming more expensive in Kent? Well, I, I think we're looking at, at the simple law of supply and demand. Uh, supply is increasing, uh, sorry, supply is decreasing because we're simply not building enough houses uh, and demand is increasing because people are looking to buy property for investments uh, to rent out because there's a real lack of viable alternative investment opportunities for people. And in terms of Kent's location, it's quite well placed within the country, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other reason why prices are increasing in Kent and the Midway regions is because we're seeing a, a wave of people from uh, who wanted to buy predominantly perhaps in London who have been outpriced to the market and that's why Kent is benefiting because of its location to London and also its really good transportation links. And in terms of on the list, um, Swanley came up as one of the top places, uh, actually the top um, place in Kent in terms of the increase with prices going up by £28,000. Do you know why that might be? Well, I, I certainly wasn't surprised to see Swanley at the top of the list, Louisa, because quite frankly, it's one of the closest, if not the closest pro uh, locations in the list to London. Mm -hmm. Also, there's been a, a, a quite a few new build properties development wise going on over there you know there's, there's a few large house builders nationwide that have been building in Swanley and that's had a positive effect on the prices in Swanley area. And some prices have actually gone down a bit especially in East Kent is there a difference between East and West in terms of property prices that you've kind of noticed? Uh, you know my own firm Dockside tend to specialise in, in Medway in the Medway areas right uh, and I think there would always be a, a disparity between prices between East and West Kent. And in terms of the future, do you see these increases continuing or do you think this might just be something that will fade out slightly? Well, simply put, you know, I come back to my point about supply. We're not, the country, not just Kent, aren't building enough properties. So I can't see anything changing. You know, the government, in fairness, have made a couple of changes recently, including a couple of weeks ago announcing that B2 properties could be converted to residential. Uh, the help to buy schemes are help is helping. So, you know, they're, they're making small progress, but they're simply not doing enough. Great. Thanks ever so much for coming in. Really interesting. Now, let's take a little look at the weather. Still plenty of clouds all around for tonight and lows of six in Tunbridge Wells. Tomorrow morning won't bring too much change though Folkestone will hit highs of 10 degrees and in the afternoon winds are picking up a bit so it might feel a tad chillier. As the weekend approaches the sun will be coming out but temperatures are set to drop all the way down to three degrees. And coming up after the break, we've spoken to commuters in Kent about what they think about plans to hike rail prices in the county. We'll see you after the break. It certainly doesn't seem any better for the price rises. Um, I don't think it's any worse, but there's more people using the trains and you don't feel like the price rises are translating into a better service for the customer. And welcome to Kent Tonight, live on KMTV. I'm Louisa Britton, your top stories on Tuesday the 5th of December. Green energy, but at what cost calls to shut down plans for Britain's biggest solar park? With a huge solar farm in, on the marsh, it will impact people's um, desire to come and walk here and enjoy the, 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 the countryside. Kent's roads claim another life. Man in his 20s dies near Maidstone. 
it was along this road, Linton Hill in Staplehurst near Maidstone, where a 22-year-old man died in a crash. Made in Kent, we check out one of the county's only grass-fed farms in Sevenoaks. What's so unique about 100% grass-fed is that every piece of land is slightly different. And in sports, the Jills get ready to face Oxford United in the second round of the Checker Trade Trophy. A village in East Kent's worried for its future if plans to build Britain's biggest solar farm goes ahead. Residents in Graveney say they don't know what their lives will look like if the £400 million development happens on their doorstep. The public consultation on the project began today. Harry Pete has more. Today marks the first day that you can have your say on a proposed plan to build a huge solar panel park between Whitstable and Faversham. The £400 million project will be the biggest of its kind in the UK and could help to ease some of the demands on the national grid in the county and also reduce our carbon footprint. But not everyone is pleased with the plans. Now, it may not look like much at the moment, but the site to the right of me here in Graveney could, if plans go ahead, be the site of a solar panel farm that could provide power to more than 100,000 homes here in Kent. Now, whilst most people are in agreement that green energy is a good thing, those who live in the village and surrounding towns say that the sheer size of the site, which is around 890 acres, which to put in comparison for you is around 400 football pitches, it's just way too big and it's going to have a massive impact on traffic, the wildlife and even business. The, the response by some of the residents here is, is very, you know, they're very worried. They're very worried what, what's going to have, the impact it's going to have on their lives. But as I say, initially the, the response was great, you know, renewable energy, we need it. Um, and we're not saying not in our backyard, but, you know, we've got to make sure it doesn't really hurt either the community or, or the, the wildlife that's in our area. Hive, the energy company behind the plans, said that they'll be looking into the environmental concerns during the public consultations and say that it's a pioneering project. One supporter when the plans were first unveiled was Canterbury MP Rosie Duffield, who said that she was excited by the idea of the solar park. Renewable energy is fantastic and exciting. We don't want to use fossil fuels, if at all possible, in the future. Um, I know there are lots of concerns about that particular site in terms of being a great place for wildlife, but obviously in theory that's a fantastic idea. The next public consultation is in Faversham tomorrow morning at the Assembly Rooms on Preston Street between half 11 and 7.30 in the evening. Harry Pete for KMTV in Graveney. Now to talk more about this solar farm and green energy, I'm joined by Kent Green Party's Stuart Jeffrey. So Stuart, why for you is it important that we use more green energy? Well, the, the world faces two huge challenges. Firstly, climate change is, is really hurting. Um, we've seen the hurricanes um, this year, uh, uh, especially in, in, in uh, the Americas. Um, but also, renewable energy um, is by its nature renewable. And, and anything that isn't renewable will run out. So we've really got a plan for the very, very long term and make sure we've got our, our energy sources from sources that won't run out for future generations. And what do you make of this plan to build a huge solar farm in Whitstable? Well, clearly we need solar as part of our mix of, uh, of green energy. Um, it is a very large, uh, a very large plan, and people are naturally worried. Um, and it is on an area that is particularly sensitive. I think there are better opportunities. Um, it does come down to economics. Clearly, a big farm is more economic and uh, viable from a from a basic economic standpoint. But actually, if the government was to put the proper support in for companies um, and the planning regulations were uh, were designed, then we could expand the roofs. There are almost a million roofs around the county, for example, all of which would be perfect, or most of which would be perfect for, um, for, for, for solar panels. Um, there are other opportunities, car parks, for example. Um, these need to be absolutely exhausted before we start building out on, on, on our green, green sites. Because there have been questions raised about sort of the integrity of the site, whether it's used for wildlife, whether it's somewhere that should be kept as a rural area. Do you think that maybe other options should be explored first? Absolutely. Um, the wildlife um, in this country and around the, the globe is under absolute threat. People are talking about the sixth great extinction. The last thing we want to do is to reduce the habitat um, and, and make the problem worse. So, so yes, absolutely, we have to explore those other options. And do you think that enough households, enough companies in Kent are being green? 
No, clearly not. Climate change is, is moving at a, at a massive pace um, and, and energy uh, from, from other sources is going to get much more expensive over the coming years. We need to be moving uh, at, at, a, at an incredibly fast pace to, to, to green our energy supplies. Great. Thanks ever so much for that, Stuart. Kent's rail passengers are bracing themselves for a huge rise in prices as part of a national change in charges. For example, under new pricing structures, a seasonal ticket from Rochester to London will cost an extra £200. The prices might be rising, but is this improving the trains? We ask commuters in Rochester what they think about Kent's rail services. It certainly doesn't seem any better for the price rises. Um, I don't think it's any worse, but there's more people using the trains and you don't feel like the price rises are translating into a better service for the customer. We won't travel on a Saturday anywhere with train because it always end up going by bus and they're doing rail works. Well, it's not brilliant, is it? No, especially um, I've got family up in Durham. If I wanted to see them at Christmas or if they wanted to come down at Christmas, that would be difficult and very expensive. I think it's really good. Um, it gets there fast. Um, there's not really many delays. Um, so I have no problem with that. It's just about the price. I, I always get a train every day from London and they're always in time. Train service is OK, yeah. As I say, I would like to travel by them, but I find it a bit expensive. I feel like it depends what train you get. So if it's the high speed, the service is usually good. But if it's the southeastern and yeah. um, the timings can be a bit dodgy. And I'm surprised that in five minutes seven trains stopped at this station, you know, both ways. I thought, well, that's, that's not a bad service really, is it? Commuters in Rochester there, but what do you think about Kent's rail service? You can join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag Kent Says. Now, don't forget that you can keep up to date on all things going on in Kent by visiting our website, kmtv.co.uk. You can check out some of our latest stories from across the county, like this video from last week about a farmer having to dump more than 150 tonnes of fruit because of labour shortages. Fruit and vegetable growers across the county could be suffering from a sharp decrease in seasonal workers from European Union nations after the Brexit vote. Employees from countries such as Bulgaria and Romania make up most of the workforce here at Oakdean Farm. They pick and pack soft fruits such as raspberries and blackberries before the harvest gets transported to shops, including our local supermarkets. But farmers are struggling to recruit and retain their workforce as uncertainty over a post-Brexit Britain seems to be making it a much less attractive place for workers from the EU. While the main fruit picking season might be over for 2017 and the raspberry plants here have been covered over for the winter, but according to this farm not far from Maidstone, it's becoming more and more difficult to recruit seasonal labour, something that many fruit farms rely on heavily. The National Farmers Union estimates that Britain's farms were almost 30% short of migrant labourers in September. And earlier this year, this fruit farm left up to 150 tonnes of raspberries to rot on the bushes as there were too few labourers to pick the produce. We probably lost uh, an income somewhere around about uh, at least a quarter of a million. Uh, the beginning of the year we were definitely suffering from the Brexit effect where people didn't really want to come because they weren't too sure what they'd expect. Uh, by the time they decided to come we had already lost crops because of this delay in getting people to come. But we're finding that whereas normally we would have people leaving and booking their place for next year, they're playing their cards tight to their chest and they're not committing. Each year, the UK needs about 80,000 seasonal workers to harvest fruit and vegetables, and there are fears worker shortages could cause supply chain disruption in 2018. 99% of them is the exchange rate, it's the saving money and taking money back to their own country, which is important. They don't want to live in the UK, they want to go back, so exchange rates are key to everything. But growers are trying to attract new workers and Tim Chambers is planning a trip to Bulgaria this weekend to meet potential recruits face to face. Even so, growers seem to be bracing for more severe shortages next year, along with the possibility that a good portion of their produce could rot before it gets picked.
This is Louisa Britton for KMTV. Now let's take a look at the weather. Still plenty of clouds all around for tonight and lows of six in Tunbridge Wells. Tomorrow morning won't bring too much change though. Folkestone will hit highs of 10. And into the afternoon, winds are picking up a bit, so it might feel a tad chillier. As the weekend approaches, the sun will be coming out, but temperatures are set to drop all the way down to three degrees. Now, after the break, we'll be talking to farmers from Seven Oaks who produce the only 100% grass fed livestock in the county. Plus, Andy will be back again with the sport. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Kent Tonight, live on KMTV on Tuesday, the 5th of December. In case you missed it, Calls to shut down plans for Britain's biggest solar park in Whitstable. The response by some of the residents here is, is very, you know, they're very worried. They're very worried what, what's going to have, the impact it's going to have on their life. Kent's roads claim another life. A man in his 20s has died near Maidstone. Ambulance, police, fire crews and the air ambulance were called to the scene, but unfortunately nothing more could be done to save the man. Higher train fares, passengers weigh in on yet another price hike. I think they've risen a lot, uh, certainly over the last four or five years they've gone up every year. I don't see an improvement in the service that we're getting. And in sport, Kent boxer Grant Dennis misses out on English middleweight title. He's demanding a rematch. Now here's Andy with the sport. Well, Andy, it was the FA Cup third round draw last night. Who will, be, will the Jills be facing? Well, third round draw is always the most exciting, I think, because that's when the big teams come into the hat and all the smaller sides from non-league and the lower leagues um, really wait with bated breath to see who they might get. And there were some huge ties in there, including a Merseyside derby between Liverpool and uh, Everton, which will be a, a big um, game. Were Jills going to get a big game? They nearly did. They were almost uh, the last out of the hat uh, and Chelsea was still in there at that point. But no, they're, they're possibly going to play uh, Sheffield Wednesday stay at Priestfield. And they haven't secured a place in the next round yet, have they? Absolutely. They still have to uh, play Carlisle and, and uh, beat them if they're to play the championship sh side Sheffield Wednesday, who are a really good team. It would be a really interesting time, but let's hope they can get through Carlisle first. And staying with the Jills, they'll also be in action tonight at Priestfield as they face Oxford United in the second round of the Checker Trade Trophy. Manager Steve Lovells made it clear he wants a strong performance from his side with the busy Christmas period approaching for the Jills, the likes of Ben Nugent and Alex Lacey have been tipped for more game time. Forward Elliot List is likely to be involved after being left out of Saturday's squad. That's all of your sport for today. We'll be back tomorrow. Time now for your pick of the papers with a look at what's making the news in print, online and radio across Kent. Earlier on today, I spoke to the KM Group's Ellis Stevenson, who started off by telling me about a man who allegedly tried to break into a teenager's bedroom at night. So this story is about a family home in Maidstone where police were called to because a 14-year-old girl had phoned her father who was sleeping upstairs in the bedroom upstairs, um, phoned his mobile, there's someone at my window. Um, so he obviously went down to her bedroom, which was on a lower level, to see what was going on. The 14-year-old girl had been approached by, allegedly approached by a man at her window, her bedroom window. She'd turned the light on in the hope that he'd go away and he he, he didn't so um, so the father came downstairs um, he'd left by then um, made his apologies and, and ran away the father then left the house and chased after him in his underwear the thought then came to him that it might be that someone was waiting around the corner so he decided to go back and wait for the police to arrive 
Great. Um, and the second story is about um, thieves targeting a school's minibus. Yeah, that's right. It's a branded minibus. So um, these, these two kids, along with the rest of their class, were waiting to go on a fishing trip. Um, it, it was almost caught short until the um, a, a neighbouring school um, offered up their minibus so they, they could go on this fishing trip. But, um, yeah, as you can see, they took the wheels off, put them on stirrups. It's not very nice for the kids. And do we know much about who, who did this? What happened? Oh, we don't. We know that the police are investigating and they're looking for anyone with um, any idea of what happened to come forward. Great. And um, the last story is about a burglar um, being sent to prison after police overheard something a bit unusual. Yeah, that's screen. right. Mark, um, Mark Ishmael um, had a haul of um, jewellery watches and electrical goods, including a stolen iPhone. Um, little did he know it was being tracked by the police. Um, then the owners tried to phone the phone. He picked up, he realised it was the stolen phone, put it down, but left the line open. So the detectives were listening, or whoever had called him was listening, and they heard um, an order for extra pepperoni on someone's pizza. So compared with the knowledge that he was in a pizza place and the tracking details, they could quickly figure out where he was. That's really smart. And, and what offences had he committed? So he admitted three offences of burglary and one of perverting the course of justice when he appeared at Maidstone Crown Court. And what was he sentenced to? So he was sentenced to five years and nine months. Great, thanks for that, Ellis. A reminder, you can watch Kent Tonight live and on Catch Up at our website, kentv.co.uk. You can stay up to date with all the news, sports and weather from right across Kent, whenever and wherever you are. You'll find breaking news, local features and repeats of our special programmes. Now for Made in Kent, where we take a look at Kent's tasty treats and delicious drinks. In a minute, we'll have some beef and lamb tasting from a farm in Sevenoaks, which feeds its livestock entirely on grass. But before then, Cameron Tucker's been to pay the farm a visit. In this week's edition of Made in Kent, I've come just south of Sevenoaks to Romshed Farm, which produces 100% pasture-fed livestock and is also trying to change the way that we taste and describe our beef. The Hereford cattle at Romshed Farm graze on clover, wildflower and all manner of grasses and hays throughout the year. Most importantly, you're not fed cereals because, of course, that modifies all the flavours because cereals are ubiquitous across the country. What's so unique about 100% grass-fed is that every piece of land is slightly different. That provides a really tasty piece of meat. Um, there's great good environmental reasons for doing it and the high animal welfare as well. Rumshed is currently one of only two 100% grass-fed farms in the county certified by the organisation Pasture for Life. With all the apparent benefits put forward by Fidelity, why haven't more farms joined in? Farming's a hard business to be in, profits are very low and change takes a long time. So if you've always had a system where you feed cereals to your cattle, it's a big change to stop doing that and do something new. So I think, it, and that in itself, it might mean even changing the breed of your cattle. So some cattle are far better, easier to do on grass than others. So change is a big thing for farmers. While cheese and wine might have an extensive tasting terminology, beef lacks a meaty vernacular, something which Fidelity is looking to address. In the first beef tasting we did, we didn't really think about the vocabulary and we were all sitting around the table tasting five amazing different cuts of beef and all we could think of was saying, that's beefy, that's beefier, that's buttery. We had very, very few, few words to describe it. So over the last year or two, we've really been building up the vocabulary. So now people might think of fresh, sweet. Lots of words are beginning to come out to describe the beef, and that's something we just need to build up. A bovine dictionary and a method of farm feeding. This Seven Oaks farm could influence the industry during the coming years. Cameron Tucker, KMTV, Seven Oaks. <laughs> Well, Cameron and Fidelity join me now on the sofa alongside some produce from Rumshed Farm. So if you can tell me a little about what we've got here. OK, so I've brought you tonight a piece of topside from Hereford Cattle and a piece of lamb leg from Clin Ewes. All 100% grass-fed and certified pasture for life, which means that 
the guarantee is that they definitely are 100% grass fed. And in terms of the taste, what different does it make? I'll just taste something. Um, yes, yeah. well, I hope you need to. And I'm going to test you to see what flavours you can taste. Yeah, thank in you. It. Thanks. Cameron, you're going to have some. No, I'm going I'm to tuck in. Uh, should I go for the beef or should I go Let's for the Let's do the beef lamb? first, shall we? Because okay. um, I'd like you to see if you can think of any vocabulary that would mm. help you. Um, sort of articulate the flavour that you can taste. Well, that's part of the... Sorry, I'll finish my mouthful <laughs> first. <laughs> that's part of the thing with this as well, is that it's not just the... It's grass-fed and you're raising awareness about that, but it's also this vocabulary that you're um, trying to get across as well. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that. Well, when we did our first beef tasting, which was a couple of years ago, all we could think of to say was, well, it's beefy or it, that mm. tastes nicer than that. And actually, if you're beef really is 100% grass fed and you start to think about some of the flavours, you can bring out some of those tastes and we think it's the terroir that helps flavour the beef just like you would wine and that what we're trying to do is build up a vocabulary around it. And ter terroir again, sorry, that's... Terroir uh... is the ground, the, the ground that the animal has been right. brought up on. So, I mean, our beef has eaten lovely wildflower rich, clover rich meadows in Kent and it'll taste different from beef that's, say, been reared on the Yorkshire Dales mm. on very different land. So, similarly, sort of honey, you hear about how honey tastes differently depending on what, what it pollinates. And is it's it similar to that in some sense? Definitely. We think it definitely is. I mean, if I... Can you... Could you put any words to what you've just tasted? Oh, I, I, I suppose it tastes really quite rich and, and, yes. and sort of, I suppose it's kind of like a quite round well, taste, I've if just, I may say. I'm just giving really... the, the, the lamb a go and it's quite sweet as well, I think, and, and there's something that you mentioned yesterday, I think part of what that might be is because at this time of year when you get the lamb, it, it might have that because it's the best grasses and, yeah. and later on in the, the year it's more of the, I guess, the heartier, the drier. Um, uh, haze, whereas this, it has got that sweeter texture. Definitely, and I think lamb is particularly interesting because they were born in April and our lambs have spent all the time out on our clover-rich meadows and they're right at the end of the season now with lots of grass growth and I think our lamb is at its absolute best now and as you say, it's got, I mean, I'd describe it as quite a complex range of flavours and in mm. fact it's more complex than the beef and I was going to ask you if you felt, if I gave you a word about the beef, so we did a tasting the other day and the woman sitting off as we said, do you know, I can taste the grass in the beef. Oh. And I thought, actually, once that idea had been mm. put in my mind, I could. And I feel that this piece of beef tastes quite like parsley. Oh, well, I, I think I'll probably have to taste lots <laughs> yes. of different ones to figure yes. out exactly. Yes. So it's just bringing out all the different plants that are in the grass and you, it does reflect in the meat. Fantastic. Lovely to taste all of that. Thanks ever so much for coming in. <laughs> uh, you've been watching Kent Tonight live on KMTV. There's more news made just for Kent throughout the evening. But for me, for now, have a lovely evening. Good night.